Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Hudson and Thames reading group presentation. So this time we're going to be tackling a paper, I guess if you could call it that. It's kind of like a paper slash a, a new project called FinGPT or Financial GPT. So, and it's this idea that these this team is trying to tackle. It's by the same guys who did FinRL, the AI for finance group. And I've titled this talk, you know, FinGPT Open Source Financial Large Language Models or not. So we're going to explore a little bit into, you know, what has happened in terms of large language models over the last couple of months, especially some of the major developments, because the timeline is particularly fascinating. And then we're also going to take a look at what FinGPT offers as a Python package and perhaps also what it doesn't. Before also doing something a bit more interesting, I kind of want to propose maybe potentially a better way of doing this which I think will be more useful for the financial community, especially if we want to start building large language models ourselves. So it's it's a little bit of a, a more general talk that talks about what developments have happened in the large language model space that we need to pay attention to, and then also kind of highlight some of the issues the financial world is going to face with this and how I think we can maybe address them. So without further ado, let's get stuck in. So the thing I want to kind of point out is that we've had maybe the craziest timeline when it comes to large language models since, you know, February of this year. So in February, on February 24th, Llama ended up launching. So this was Meta's kind of large language model. They open sourced the architecture, but not the weights. And then, you know, just over a week later, the weights actually ended up leaking on 4chan. And this kicked off um, one of the biggest kind of proliferations of, of innovation from the open source community in terms of large language models. So since those weights leaked on 4chan, what Meta ended up doing is changing their license agreement. Instead of going after and suing people, they said, okay, you can't use it for commercial stuff, but for research, go ahead. And on March 12th, we saw Llama working on a Raspberry Pi. A day later, we saw it fine-tuned on consumer hardware. So we saw it fine-tuned using just a single 4090, using a technique known as LoRa, and this produced the alpaca models. You know, five days after that, Llama.cpp ended up launching, which got Llama to run on a MacBook CPU, FOST, where it's actually like can rapidly generate these tokens, which was an amazing breakthrough. And this has ended up spawning its own framework, actually, now that a lot of other models are, are being made compatible on. Then on March 19th, just a day later, Vicuna ended up matching Google's BARD and was fine-tuned using only $300, again, thanks to Laura and, and these kinds of things. Then on March 25th, less than a week later, GPT for all ended up launching, which created this ecosystem around, around large language models. Three days later, Cerebras ended up beating GPT-3 using a fully open source model. So now we no longer need Llama's weights, which we can't use for commercial reasons. Now we have a model that we can use commercially. Two days later, Bloomberg GPT ended up launching, which used a closed model and a closed data set. We actually did a talk on this. We covered it, which was quite a lot of fun to do. So that talk is also freely available if you want to check it out on YouTube. And then... You know, four days later, Koala, which is 13 billion parameters, ended up launching. It was fine-tuned on a very small data set. Stanford did this one. And humans can't tell the difference between it and ChatGPT. And they fine-tuned this for about $100. And then two weeks later, or just under two weeks later, Open Assistant ended up launching their own model that and a data set for reinforcement learning with human feedback, which is how InstructGPT or ChatGPT was trained. And it ends up beating ChatGPT. So we went from March 3rd, weights getting leaked on 4chan to an entire ecosystem in just six weeks. This is crazy. Like this is, this is why I call it the wildest timeline. This just exploded. And a source for, for all of these timelines is, is down here. It's written by, it is actually an internal memo that leaked inside of Google called, I think it's called OpenAI doesn't have a moat and neither does Google, something along those lines. Highly recommend you go check it out. It kind of explains why these large language models and specifically the open source movement is completely changing the game when it comes to these things. And so, you know, long story short, the level of innovation in terms of large language models is the fastest it's ever been. I find it quite funny that in this timeline that we're in, that Mark Zuckerberg of all people ends up being the good guy. You know, Meta is the only big AI research institution that's actually releasing models for free. You know, open AI is the opposite of open, 
And they seem to be parading around trying to make people scared and trying to motivate why they should be the only ones in control of large language models. I have a bit to say about that later. But yeah, all of a sudden, Mark Zuckerberg is actually the good guy for releasing weights and actually helping open source development. And now open source is dominating large language model development. If you've been paying attention to what's happening on Twitter, people have been training their own large language models on 4090s that they're buying off of eBay, and they're able to do it pretty affordably. And you know, now training your own large language model is more accessible than ever. It's still pretty hard. The tooling is quite new and rough around the edges and the hardware is still expensive. But the point is with a laptop, you can now train your own large language model. And this is crazy because at the beginning of this year, large language models were only reserved for companies with millions of dollars. So ma this has been a massive breakthrough. So I want to just give a little bit more context on the two big breakthroughs that made this possible because they're going to be important to know. The first is LoRa or what's known as low rank adaptation. And this was probably the biggest reason why fine tuning became available for these language models to, you know, regular human beings, and especially on consumer hardware. So it reduces trainable parameters by up to 10,000. And the result is that the GPU requirements, which tends to be the biggest bottleneck for training, you know, neural networks, doing stable diffusion, all of this stuff, it reduces that by a factor of three. And what's amazing is despite this reduction in memory usage, it turns out that we get at par or better performance than when we try and fine tune the entire model. And so how this essentially works is if you think about what happens when you're fine tuning a model is you have an existing set of weights. And what you do is you're updating these weights, these pre-trained weights with new examples. And typically that would just take the shape of a matrix the same size. But now if you're a little bit more creative, you have this thing that you know that we know of as rank factorization. So you can decompose a matrix into two smaller matrices that when multiplied by each other, you know, produce a, a matrix approximating the original one. So essentially you're doing factorization. And it turns out that these two matrices will actually have, you know, less dimensions when you add them together than the full matrix. So you can imagine if this was a thousand by 1000 matrix, that's 10,000 parameters. But if you imagine you had a thousand by five, let's say the rank is five and a thousand by five, well, suddenly that's way fewer parameters. It's a, you know, a factor of 10 or something ridiculous, fewer parameters that you have to store in memory. And so it's just this clever way of exploiting, you know, rank factorization in order to re dramatically reduce the amount of memory that we need in order to fine tune these models. And so now by doing this, suddenly these 65, 64, like massive billion parameter models, suddenly they're trainable on laptops, which is a, a massive breakthrough. The only kind of caveat that I had as an electronic engineer is I wish this wasn't called LoRa. LoRa is an extremely well-known acronym. It stands for Long Range Wireless Networks. There's a whole bunch of hardware packages that allow you to have these long range, you know, radio communications. That's also called LoRa and how Googling stuff is a pain, but this is LoRa. So this is the first kind of big breakthrough that dramatically changes things. And the second is quantization. So what quantization essentially allows you to do is a lot of these operators that we do, they're stored as 16-bit as floating point vectors. But what we could do is we can instead, you know, represent these as 8-bit or even in some cases 4-bit integers. And this just dramatically saves the amount of memory that we need. So this is one example of how quantization could work. You convert everything to an integer and then you just have a quantization factor. You can quantize it as an 8-bit vector and right at the end when you need to dequantize it, you just divide by that factor again. But this way you can get way less memory that you require in order to both load and train these. So this is good for both inference and fine tuning. And so we can actually see over here for a 7 billion parameter model, we actually can almost linearly decrease the size, right? If we just use quantization. And the perplexity was just kind of a measure of how much, how good a job a model does of compressing language. We see that it's very, very similar. Lower values are better, but we can see that at 8-bit quantization, it's identical in 4-bit. It's not too far off. So these two, LoRa and quantization, essentially allows us to do both fine-tuning of these large language models and also inference at, at a much smaller scale than was previously possible. And so this is the kind of environmental context that FinGPT finds itself in. So 
you know, let's say the stage has been set in, in many ways, and it's a better time than ever to produce large language models and to fine tune them specifically. So what exactly is FinGPT? Okay, so contrary to the marketing, FinGPT is not actually a large language model, at least not yet, right? Instead, what it's aiming to do is be a framework for producing large language models for financial applications. So FinRL, which we also covered a couple of weeks ago, it does that for reinforcement learning. And FinGPT is trying to do that for large language models in the, in the kind of financial space. They, they claim anyway that this is in response to Bloomberg GPT, which I think is a, a justifiable motivation. Reminder again that Bloomberg GPT both used a closed data set and also closed architecture or a closed model. They didn't release it. And all of this is made possible by the innovations from our timeline that we looked at earlier. And in addition to this, you know, like we spoke about in the Bloomberg GPT talk, it's not just about getting the architecture to work. It's also about having the right data set. And so they have a sister project called FinNLP, NLP standing for natural language processing, that is supposed to be a tool for generating these kinds of financial data sets. I'm not convinced it succeeds at this yet. We'll take a look at it in a second to understand why, but it's a step in the right direction. They also want to call large language models in the financial domain Fin LLMs. I think this is a silly name. I think we can do better, but that's more of a side note. Okay, so this is the claimed architecture of which FinGPT wants to be. So essentially, we have FinNLP, which will read in all of these data sources for us and aggregate it into a data set. Then over here, we will do some things like cleaning or cloning, if you want to read the typos literally. Things like tokenization, um, stemming and limitization, feature extraction and prompt engineering, which then kind of gets fed into these trainable open source models. We can then use LoRa and reinforcement learning with human feedback. They use reinforcement learning on stock prices, but it's the same concept. You use feedback from humans in order to improve your models. And then they have this application layer where we take these large language models that have been fine-tuned and we use them for a specific task. This is what they kind of want to build and what they're proposing they build. But right now, the only parts that have really been built, and it's a little bit hacky still, is FinNLP and some of these fine-tuning methods and integrating some of these models. But it's, it's a very loose wrapper over a bunch of open source tools. They're just kind of composing open source tools for now. I'm hoping this will improve, but this is where they're going. This is what they say they're doing. The one thing that's important to kind of keep sight of is they're not saying we don't want to use closed models. So you can still use chat GPT via the open AI API in order to kind of, you know, maybe you end shot learn or few shot learn or prompt some of these kind of closed models via their API to still do this. So it's a very general kind of framework for doing large language models inside of the financial kind of context and domain. But one of the things a lot of the, the research has shown us is that data quality is far more important than data scale, especially when it comes to fine tuning a model. And this has actually been underreported a lot. And so like we spoke about, Koala used only 300,000 examples to fine tune. I think it was a 63 billion parameter model, something like that. It was a smaller model. I mean, to put into context, I think chat GPT is like 200 and, or no, 175 billion parameters. Maybe that's GPT-3, but it's up there. It's in like the hundreds of billions. And it used a model that's, you know, let's say roughly speaking, a third of the size and only 300 fine tuning examples to get something close to chat GPT performance. And it only cost them a hundred dollars of compute. And I think it took them like a couple of hours to train. It's something ridiculous like that. And this is a good thing because it addresses one of the big issues with Bloomberg GPT, which is that the data is closed. And so FinNLP, like I spoke about, is a tool that tries to kind of address this. And so they have a whole bunch of these data sources that they make accessible. They have new social media filing trends and actual data sets that exist. But the problem is with FinNLP is that it's not a curated data set for financial large language models. It's just a connector for Chinese and US financial data sources. So like we said, they're looking at things like news, social media, announcements from companies, trends, and there are some data sets that they incorporate. The problem for me with this is as anyone who's wanted to do research and look at an API for financial data, whether it's news, whether it's actual values, whether it's prices, whether it's market data, that kind of thing, it's, it's, it's an absolute clown show out there. There's so many different providers. 
They all have different pricing models. They all work in slightly different ways. There's no clear standard for which ones to use. They all have different APIs. They all, some of them support Python, which in our case is cool. Some of them don't. And so you have to roll your own. And so it's actually a bit of a disaster. It's one of those things that that is frustrating. I mean, look, it makes sense, right? When you're dealing in the financial domain, information is is everything. And so a lot of like these data shops have kind of jumped out and want to provide this data, but it just means that getting these data sets is a complete disaster. It's it's almost impossible to know where you should start. Some of these data sources are premium, some of them are free, but you still need an API key. So what that means is registering in a bunch of different places, plugging in your API key and building your own data set. That's, that sucks. That's still a big issue, but at least they're trying to kind of put this all in, in one place. And so for me, it's kind of like, okay, what data should I be collecting then if I want to train a financial large language model? And that kind of begs the question for me, which is what are the goals we want to achieve? And that's a big issue. It's something I actually kind of want to maybe probe the room about in a second when we, when we kind of stop this recording and chat offline which is a shameless plug for why you should join the live reading group sessions because we have some good discussions afterwards, which we don't share. But okay, let's, let's dive into the code base. So it's a bit empty and they only have one you know, example where they fine tune a large language model. So they do this on Chinese financial news where they direct the, where they predict the direction that the stock is going to go based on news. They use ChatGLM, which is a bilingual Chinese and English large language model that's been trained in a similar way to ChatGPT. And then it just, but it leverages like an external open source project to do the fine tuning. It's not like they figured out how to do the fine tuning themselves. And there are a couple of other examples on sentiment analysis and robo advising, but it ends up all just being calls to OpenAI's ChatGPT API. So cool, but that doesn't solve anything. Or any of us could have done this already. It's some very simple prompting. And so it's a bit disappointing. Pointing. And in my view, you know, still very, very early days. And it's also clear that this is a lot more about assembling parts from the open source community. And while I don't think there's anything wrong with that, having read the paper, I do think it's slightly offensive that they've made these big claims and these grand claims about taking the fight to Bloomberg and being all about open models, but then you can't back them up with solid engineering. You're just kind of loosely assembling some Lego blocks. And for me, I, I think this is a case of kind of exploiting the hype a little bit, and I don't agree with it. You should be able to talk the talk if you're going to walk. You should be able to walk the walk if you're going to talk the talk. And in this case, I think it's a, a little bit of a marketing gimmick, which is disappointing for me because FinRL is actually quite useful in this regard. They've provided some value. They've done some, some really good engineering. And so this is clearly very early days. And I, I would have liked to see this bake in the oven a bit more than them go here. Because when I looked at the commits, there's only about 200 commits right now on the project. It seems to be more commits updating the readme than they were actually writing code. And so I'm hoping this continues to develop. But right now, if you had to ask me honestly what I'd think, hmm, I'm a little suspicious. Or not suspicious, I'm a little disappointed. Let's put it that way. So I'd, as a response to this, I'd actually like to make a proposal for how we'd actually get to a good open you know, financial LLM. And I think like with all things, we need to start with the goal. What exactly do we want to achieve with a, a large language model when it comes to the financial world, right? Because, you know, the chat GPT kind of world, there's reasoning involved, but all of it stems from just trying to predict the next token. What actually are we trying to get out of a large language model when it comes to, you know, us financial practitioners in, in our domain? Because, Bloomberg GPT has one really good use case, right? They have Bloomberg query language, so BQL, which you use in the Bloomberg terminal in order to write queries that give you the results that you want. And sometimes it might just be easier to express what you want in natural language and then get the Bloomberg query language back, which you can immediately run and kind of get the, the analysis that you want. And we're seeing, you know, the open source equivalents to this kind of like OpenBB, they're doing the same thing. They're also kind of looking at large language models to make it easier for their users to do the analysis. But if we're not going to be doing that, if we don't have our own kind of query language, what exactly do we want out of a large language model in this particular case? Like what, and, and I think a good way of framing this question is what exactly do we want to automate? Which parts of our job is difficult? You know, what do we actually want the model to do? Do we want it to be, be able to do some analysis? 
right? So, so we've, we give it some time series data about an asset and we ask it like, Hey, what do you notice about this? That's interesting. You know, is it, does it look like it's been going up? Does it seem to be correlated with the market? Is it maybe correlated with some other assets that I know about? You know, what kind of questions do we want to ask? I think that's really going to be important. Do we want to analyze company statements? Do we want to do sentiment analysis? Do we want to get strategy, possible strategy ideas based off of, you know, what we see in data or based off of what we see in news or based off of some other kind of sentiment analysis that we do? Because the goal that we have is going to ultimately inform our data set, right? That's the most important point I want to get to. The feeling I got looking through the, the FinGPT repos, we don't actually know what we want these things to do yet. And then we'll have to collect the data, right? And if you can't collect the data set, you'll have to create it. The problem with that is who owns those, those data sets? So Japan has been very interesting right now. Japan has said, you know, if you're doing AI research, I think there's no copyright on the data that you can scrape. Europe has, has some other ideas. Sadly, the US is still kind of figuring out what they want to do with this. Um, but we're going to start kind of collecting data. And then what I suggest we do is you grab the smallest, you know, 7 billion parameter llama model that you can or some kind of derivative and just fine tune it on this data set. And then you evaluate it in a zero shot or few shot context against the original model and see if you've done better or not. And then what you do is you have to publish, release the weights and release the data set. That's kind of what we need to do. So we need to stop. I don't think we need to build frameworks just yet. What I think we need to do is figure out a very specific goal that we want a large language model to do in the financial domain, collect the data, fine tune it, evaluate it and put it out there and say, this is kind of the ground floor. This is where we're starting. That's what I suggest we should do if we want an actually open financial large language model. And the reason I think this, import, this is important is because of this guy right here. So AI and machine learning and large language models are incredibly powerful, but like any technology, they just provide leverage, right? They allow you to do more things. And I do not think the world benefits if these models are controlled by a chosen few. And the reason I use that word chosen few rather than a select few is because what's happening right now is these big companies that have produced these large language models, they're obviously going on world tours where they're trying to convince, convince world leaders that only they should be allowed to train these things and to use them, right? So you might've heard all of the, the AI danger hype and there's huge debates and go on. And it's awfully convenient to see these companies go around and call for a legislative moat after they've already crossed the moat and already have a monopoly, right? Awfully convenient. For me, it looks like these people have figured out that they have something. The open source world is developing at a rapid pace. And what they want world leaders to do is to say, oh, actually, only these big companies, they're the only ones who are allowed to train these models. And I think this is not the way things should go. I think it is absolutely critical that we develop our own offline open source large language models, right? And this is where there's a big AI debate that can kick off and, you know, everyone can come at each other with, with axes and pitchforks and stuff like that. But I will say something, the danger of AI is being used as a red flag in order to muscle politicians and people into, into giving the keys to this technology to a select chosen few. And I disagree with this fundamentally. This is the worst possible thing that we could be doing. And, you know, there's, there's maybe just to phrase it in an interesting way. So I'm stealing this from, from George Hotz, but, you know, he says there's this argument, you know, when it comes to gun control, for example, the only way to stop a bad person with a gun is a good person with a gun. Now that's the one argument which you can may or may not prescribe to, but I think when it comes to AI, the only way to stop a bad person with AI is a good person with AI. I think that it rings even more true in this particular case. We should not be constraining who has, who has a hold of these things to the select few. And so it's actually really important that we figure out how to do this. Projects like this, where they faff around, I think they do a disservice. And so I think it's really important that we get to this point where we actually start building these open source models. I don't want Bloomberg to be the only ones doing this and neither do I want OpenAI to be the only ones doing this. So in conclusion, I, I think the only conclusion we can kind of draw at this stage is that as of now, FinGPT is a half-assed attempt at exploiting hype. 
I think this is a pity because FinRL has a lot of promise and a lot more polish, even though it also just composes open source projects. But right now, this isn't an alternative to Bloomberg GPT, and there is no data set, which I think is the most important part. And figuring out how to do this is going to be hard. I wonder if someone shouldn't just scrape things by hand and put it out there and say, YOLO, not my problem. But we'll see. We'll see how, how much trouble you'll get into for doing this. But it does get a few things right. And I do think there's credit here, right? The law on quantization has changed the game. You cannot find tuna model for hundreds of dollars. And open source is winning. So I'm glad someone's trying to build a frame. I just think they should add a bit more effort behind this. But what I do think is fundamentally, if we want this, we need to figure out what our goals are, right? So what is the actual useful application? And I think I would like to get suggestions maybe from the floor for what we think these large language models can be good at, specifically what they can automate at that's difficult for us to do as financial professionals. And for me, this is where it starts, right? It's easier than ever before to build these things. We just need to figure out what we want to build and then get started doing it. And so that is kind of where I want to end things off. So thank you very much for joining. If you're online, I hope you, you enjoyed watching this. And if you're in the reading group, after I stop this recording, we'll kind of open the floor for questions and comments and debate this a little bit on what you think we should do.